Hope, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, thank you for coming out. I know this is Sunday and you guys have families or whatnot, but certainly appreciate you and, and covering uh, and giving our football team and our program and our university the exposure that you have. And um, kind of neat to see you guys after a couple of days of practice. In fact, today was our first day in shells after going two days of just helmets and shorts. Um, what, you, what you see out there so far is obviously there's a there's a cultural, you know, change going on that involves a lot of energy, enthusiasm, um, just a lot of juice. And it's something that uh, goes along and blends in well with teaching and coaching. You know, we have a lot of staff continuity from the previous year. Our schemes, you know, we have the opportunity to not only, you know, expand on them and kind of elevate their efficiency, but we have a chance to better ourselves through familiarity, which is really important to our players. Um, what you see is... Uh, a lot of good plays, but not so many. There's still some bad plays out there as well, the typical early camp stuff. But what you see is a, a group of young men that have really taken to an off-season program, and it's showing up. It's showing up in the way we move, the way we bend, the way we run. We're faster. We're a little bit more explosive. We have better balance and body control, so we can now practice in pads and practice our, our drills full speed and not end up on the ground. Okay, and that's really important. Last year, we felt that we had to improve the way that we practiced still being able to do the things that we need to do without ending up on the ground and getting guys hurt. We bend better, we come out of our hips better. Uh, we're certainly a little bit more physical up front at the line of scrimmage. Uh, and overall, just a um, very solid first couple of days. I think uh, the best part about it is leaders are leading, culture is getting stronger, and we're accomplishing what we need to do in an efficient manner. We're obviously a high tempo of offense, so uh, the tempo of practice has been really, really strong. and. Um, I'll tell you, it, it's hard for the freshmen because they're going through a regimen that they've never, ever experienced before. But they've done a pretty good job keeping up. And as of right now, all freshmen are in play to have playing time. So uh, just a little bit of a snapshot of where we are so far after the first couple of days. So uh, with that being said, open to questions. Do you recall your first camp as a freshman, you know, trying to play that <laughs> position? And, and what does that say about them? That's that... a horrible memory, man. I'm having a good day. You want to bring that up right now. But yeah. what, what does that I'll tell say you. about them that they could Let be me explain right that away. day for you, all right? Being 230 pounds, which I have no business playing offensive line, and you go to the University of Miami, and it's Cortez Kennedy, and it's Russell Maryland, and it's Danny Stubbs and those types. So I was 6'7", and they shrunk me down to 6'4 by blunting me on a daily basis over there in practice. So um, it is 100 miles an hour. And you want them to get it right away, and it's not going to happen. It's not. And you have to realize as a coach, you have to have patience to understand this is a whole different environment, right? This is a whole different regimen, a set of demands. And th they have great attitudes. I mean, their head is spinning, literally. It's like I've seen eyes go backwards and forward about 15 times. But they're doing a heck of a job because the upperclassmen have done a great job being uh, serving as leaders for them. So, um, but it's the best thing we can do. Keep teaching, keep going. The way practice is set up nowadays, there are no more two a days. Before we had what, like five a days, right back in the day. Now it's you can't even have a two a day. So we spend a lot of time meeting and bringing them along. On the right, right here. Jason. <clears throat> yeah, coach, you talk a lot about power on the line of scrimmage. You yes, want sir. to be a line of scrimmage football team, but you also just said, hey, we're an up tempo team. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of mesh those two things together? And is that maybe the next phase of college football we'll see? And on that note, you know, five years ago. Uh, this was a strictly up tempo. They just blew mm -hmm. people away with their up tempo. Yes, sir. What what we see this year out of this team? We know everybody's gone to up tempo, and at the last place I was at, we had to learn a lesson the hard way, right? People were going up tempo on us, and all of a sudden we were getting outscored. Okay, so we spent the the next off season actually visiting, you know, the university that that did us, you know, pretty badly in the bowl game. And combining the elements of up-tempo offense with the physicality at the line of scrimmage. Okay, so you know the uh, it's almost like your your time, your increments, right? Your time in between plays is shorter, so you have to train your guys to be just as explosive play one through play ninety, without giving up a single amount of finish, toughness, and physicality. So um, it is very easily combined. We have been doing it. The principles of what we play with up front are NFL principles, right? NFL rules, right? Uh, the way we ID stuff, the way we block it, our man blocks, double teams, you know, pin and pull schemes, whatever it may be. So um, that's what we have been working on since the springtime and, you know, our whole installation throughout the entire summer and now the fall. So uh, it's a good combination. You have a quarterback that knows how to manage it, can also flip our stuff to the RPO game that has really been effective in practice. 
Um, so that's what you can expect from us, being explosive, being fast, but being physical at the line of scrimmage. We do not want to take away from our tempo. It's been a valuable asset to Oregon for a long, long time. Mario, uh, a lot of coaches have different philosophies on whether or not they want their freshmen to speak with the media and kind of, you know, be put in that situation. You obviously don't have a problem with this. What's no. what, what's kind of your philosophy and thought process behind that? I, I just don't think you put a timetable on when someone's ready. It kind of be the same thing like saying, well, we don't play freshmen because they're not going to be ready. Some guys do a really good job and they're mature and uh, they're really good representatives and ambassadors of the program. So. Why not, right? You know, it's a, uh, we don't have a, I guess I never got the handbook on that, you know, maybe you could help me out and get me one. Uh, I think the guys will do a great job with you. I think you'll enjoy them. Uh, they're certainly real awesome young men and, and they're learning a lot now. They're learning a lot. I'm sure they're wondering why their break is cut short and they got to meet with the media, but <laughs> I think their families will enjoy it. And I think it's important uh, that the rest of the country understands and realize that we don't we don't discriminate. We, you could be a freshman, you could be a, a fifth year five star guy, you could be a guy that just came into the door as a walk on. You know, here it's about earning, you know, your possibilities and your opportunities and they have earned the opportunity to speak to the media. Last year, your offensive lineman played, that started, played like 96% of the snaps along the line. Is that going to be pretty typical for you, or was that just kind of like a one-year deal of lack of depth that you didn't feel comfortable with? Uh, a little bit of both. You know, at the, always I'm a big fan. Whatever the head coach wants, that's what you do. I never, ever dispute that, never argue that. That was something that our head coach wanted, and that's something that we abided by. Now, philosophically here, Myself, I like to treat the offensive line position like any other position. You've got to play guys. You just mentioned it, 96% of the plays, the actual number count was 980 plus snaps. That's a lot of plays, right? You know, that's like the old Ford in the, in the garage, right, with a whole bunch of miles on it. So you don't want to put too many more miles on that, right, when you have other ones that can do it. We have a lot of good offensive linemen, and playing time is going to be divvied out as they deserve it. We do feel that, you know, that line that you draw and who's above the line that could help you win a championship, we do feel we're going to have eight, nine, ten guys that could help us win a championship up front, and we're going to play them all. Um, Coach, you talked a lot of, in spring ball about discipline and how that momentum kind of carried over. The other day you said that guys were showing up to meetings 15, 10 minutes early. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've seen in the first couple of days of fall camp? And um, are you pleased with the discipline that they've been able to carry over? Absolutely. You know, we have officials out there for practice. We had one holding today, and we had two illegal procedures, and that's three penalties too much. We want to limit penalties to once every 30 plays at a maximum. And they have to be ones that are actually forced, unforced penalties we don't want. You see the energy and enthusiasm, and we explain to our guys and make it very clear that your mental intensity is going to be reflected by how you show up and when you show up, right? Let's call it what it is. If a guy ever shows up late, and, and we could talk about how the cell phone is not working or we lost power, and not buying that. Not buying that at all, okay? I'm sure we've all had right, responsibilities for the past, whoever's been around long enough, like I have 30 plus years and you've never been late to any of those things. Well, we had the exact same rules and principles. The Senior Leadership Council and some of the other guys in the Leadership Council, they're completely driving that entire objective and that directive. And so we see, we're seeing it. And you know what we're telling the guys too, so we're all on the same page. We're making sure that they understand clearly that we have to be able to push them to help them get to a place where they're having a breakthrough. Sometimes people say, well, we're going to make you or break you in camp. We don't, that's not what we're doing here. We're going to make you and we're going to break bad habits to help you go forward. And I think once a player allows you to push him past a certain limit and his limitations, I think now you have yourself the type of relationship you want between a coach and a player. You mentioned in the secondary on Thursday that um, you have a, not as many bodies as you'd like, but you like the talent there. Mm -hmm. Two guys in particular, Diamador and Thomas, what have you seen from the end of the last season when they finished pretty well yeah. to now where they seem like they're really entrenched at those starting spots? Sure. Thomas, you could see a second-year player in action is what you see. Much more savvy, body has developed, more explosive, more of a leader. A guy that can now help correct the other guys and can self-correct himself as well. Diamador has had a really big spring. Diamador is a really physical guy. I like to get him involved in every kind of special teams as well. His skill set has always been a really good skill set, but 
he had to work out the kinks of getting out there and playing against power five, you know, wide receivers. He's done so. We trust him in every single call that we have, zone, man, whatnot, combination, coverages. Both those guys have been really, really good so far in camp. Coach, uh, Brian Addison, a great example of a guy that you're trying to figure out which side of the ball you could most use him on soonest. Any mm -hmm. other guys in that category kind of trying to figure out which side of the ball, wh what position exactly they're going to play in to start this season? Mm -hmm. No, we will. You know, we'll take guys like, uh, heck, we may take Jalen Red and see if he could go cover somebody and be part of a nickel package. Uh, we'll take one of those jumbo defensive linemen and see if he could, you know, provide an extra blocker on a particular scheme. I mean, we'll do it all. We'll take a sixth or seventh offensive lineman and line him up and say, hey, let, let's see if this guy could serve as a better blocker, certainly not a pass catcher, uh, as a tight end. So, you know, our personnel groupings, I think what you're going to see as the season goes on, we're pretty multiple on offense. And you're going to see that if you're a tight end, you have to wear the same hat, meaning you have to know the same position as every wide receiver or tailback on the team. Because our formations are all concept oriented. They're all overlaps. So blank formation means that these guys go to these spots regardless of what personnel group that we're in. That's going to help us a bunch in keeping teams off balance. So, and, and no one is off limits on either side of the ball to putting them on, uh, you know, to having some guys switch over and play on the other side. Coach, can you just talk a little bit about your game day, what you will be handling on the sidelines and give how, how that will unfold? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm always going to be involved with the offensive side of the ball. Marcus Arroyo is our play caller, okay? Um, Coach Mastro is serving as our run game coordinator, but I'm heavily, heavily, heavily involved in the run game plan as well. I'm always on the headsets with both sides because if there is a call that I feel it really isn't the best call for us at the time, you know, then I'll, I'll do whatever necessary to make sure we get the best call available. And I like to let the coordinators call their game. We do meet throughout the course of the week. We game plan every phase of the game, and even up till the morning of game day, we meet to review any and all situations, and the craziest situations imaginable. I mean, from where the sun is setting at, you know, where it's pointing at at 3.30, if we're getting the ball in the second quarter and they're punting, you know, to the other side, or whether we are playing in overtime, where's the student section, which way do we want to go, do we want the ball first, we want to be on defense first. We review every single possible situation, so we, uh, we expect it to be pretty smooth on game day. One of the things we've seen over the last couple of seasons here is the importance of that backup QB role. Yeah. What is that competition shaping up to be right now, and what are your expectations for that role? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you bring that up. And you know, I mentioned it a couple of times throughout the past, uh, I would say, month and in the springtime. Those guys have been impressive. They both have been impressive. They both run the offense extremely well. We chart what they do in every drill, one-on-one, seven-on-seven, -on -seven, blitz drill, team run, play action. Our second and third down period, our pure third down period, two minute, red zone, you name it, we chart it all. Those guys have really pushed up their completion percentage, another eight, 10 percent. They've been really efficient with the ball. They've been really good decision makers. I think another year again with Coach Marcus Arroyo has made a tremendous difference. Marcus has done a great job with those guys. And today was a great example. I mean, today was empty protections, bringing guys from all over the place, multiple coverage looks. and. You know, those, that receiving core, those tight ends, and, uh, and Justin, and Braxton, and Tyler, they were on point now. They made some big plays. Took some in the chin, too, now. Defense made some really good plays also. But you see our players, you see development. I mean, you see guys, instead of eating the ball or making a poor decision and spitting out in the wrong area, you see guys making plays or at least making the right decision and trying to put the ball in the right spot. And that's growth, you know, from the quarterbacks, the type of growth that you want to see during camp. Mario, I was curious about uh, Troy Dye. Obviously, as a true freshman, he was very productive on a, on a bad defense last year, moved him inside, productive again on an improving defense. What are you expecting from him now that he's so experienced? A really, really great play on a really great defense. <laughs> the next natural step, right? I think that's what he expects of himself. I think that's what his teammates expect of him. And I think we're going to see that as well. Troy's not satisfied with the things of the past. He kind of lives where his feet are right now. He's been really good about pushing and encouraging his teammates and being a good team leader, mentor to the young guys. He will take that next step. It, we demand it of him. He demands it of himself. And our football program, our team, needs that to happen. So let's see it happen. Let's make it happen. 
Coach, I wanted to ask a little bit. Last year, uh, uh, penalties were a problem. You mentioned sure. it earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do to address that? And it, when you went back and looked at the film last year, did mm -hmm. you find that most of those penalties were penalties of enthusiasm or penalties of maybe a brain cramp or something along those lines? I like those brain cramps. <laughs> you have a little bit of both. And I think you're exactly on point 100%. You have to face that dead on and realize, you know what? From a coaching standpoint, number one, that's what it falls on, right? The coach is number one. Because we're either teaching it or we're allowing it to happen. And we, unfortunately, we allowed it to happen, all right? Number two is the educational aspect. What are you doing that is not legal within the rules of the game? A lot of it has to do with understanding exactly what to do on a play, how to do it, and why we're doing it that way. For example, and this is the one that probably showed up, um, I would say 35%, 40% of the time. If you're an offensive blocker and you've got to get a certain hat position, right? I got to get my hat outside on you on that defensive end because that ball's going to go outside. But I get my hat on the inside. Well, the back's still thinking he's going to spit the ball outside. Well, when that defensive end breaks for the ball, he's already outside. He leaves. I try to tug him, and there goes the flag. All cause because I kind of understood I had to block the guy, but now how I had to block him and why I had to block him in that way. And when you understand that, and when you understand what everybody around you is doing, you eliminate half of your penalties. The second part is we have to, um, we have to make sure, like in practice, if you come to practice, you'll see that we have officials out there just about every single day. They also come to our meetings and they watch film so we could be really specific and aggressive by how we approach and attack our penalty situation. Um, I think when you add those things, I think when you add a strength and conditioning program, that demands being early, that demands doing things exactly the right way, along with a culture that does the same thing. I just think the mentality and the culture that comes with that helps you improve your mindset towards playing the game of football. What's the goal, right? The goal is to have success on each and every play, play the next one without hurting the football team, right? Can't be selfish, can't be foolish, and we are, we're learning that. We had to learn it the hard way last year, and uh, the goal is make sure we don't learn that lesson again. Your first press conference of spring football, you talked about the women's basketball team. The end of spring press conference, you talked about the softball team. And then this Thursday, you talked about all the other coaches that have been hired here. Where does that come from? You've, you've been seen promoting a lot of other teams, and your players are, are constantly seen at other sporting events. Where does that come from of just supporting everybody else? And I mean, your job's super high demanding already, and it seems like you're bought in on everybody else's programs too. I have no hobbies. I got the most boring person on earth, man. You know, I got nothing to do. Um, no, uh, on a side note, it's just that you either are family or you're not. And the DNA, and this is set by, by our leader, you know, Rob Mullins, is that it's a DNA of everyone in the athletic department. You know, we are here together as a family. We are here to support each other. Um, we all know the challenges of being a power five program in every aspect. And they're just, and let's call it what it is. If you love sports and you love being a competitor, you watch the way our women's teams were playing, was watching basketball. I take my sons to watch those basketball games all the time, both men's and women. I'm a terrible basketball player. I swear I could, you know, I can't make a layup, but just the way they coach and they teach and they push and the way they execute, they demand from each other. I learn a lot from that. I do. I learn a lot from our other coaches. I always try to take a, a deeper dive into them and their life and what they're about because that helps us become tighter as an athletic department, thus strengthening and galvanizing you know, everyone here as the Oregon family. Coach, I think you added three grad transfers. I'm curious and kind of what's the, the benefit of adding those players and maybe speak to all three of them? Yeah, well, we felt they could upgrade our talent and our roster, and we did so. Uh, Dallas Warmack, interior offensive lineman. Uh, obviously, I knew him from before at Alabama, really good football player, uh, powerful, right? A uh, guy that could move the line of scrimmage, good balance, uh, good pass protector. We thought he could help us. Kano Dillon, 270-pound tight end that could run, really soft hands. Uh, a bunch of uh, our guys knew him from his time at South Florida. Really, really talented guy that could help us do a lot of things, stretch the field and control the line of scrimmage. Uh, Tabari Hines, 50-plus catches in the ACC. Certainly a guy that's an experienced route runner, uh, a mature, polished guy. I know he's a little bit dinged up, so we haven't seen him in live action yet, but those are three guys at three positions that are always going to need help. So any opportunity that we have to upgrade the roster without ever compromising character, okay, drive, determination, DNA, any chance we get to upgrade it, we're going to do so because either they're making, you know, significant 
plays for your offense and defense, or they're up in the competition, hence making everybody better, right? Competition's a beautiful thing now. That's the best part about camp right now. Why are guys getting better and pushing? Because there's a guy right behind them and a guy right behind him, and that's the way it should be, right? Stack them up, develop them, don't put them aside on the cupboard, don't let develop them, work with them every single day, and create that type of environment, and um, so far, so good with those guys. Hi, Coach. Hello. Um, so, I, as you probably know, um, Justin Herbert was pretty shy when he when he arrived on campus a, a year or two ago, and, and now that Did you see had, his haircut, yeah, back then. <laughs> oh, I have not. No. Okay. Well, back then, I mean, I, I would have been shy too. With oh, that back then, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, now that you've had a good year with him, how would mm -hmm. you say he's grown both emotionally um, and physically? It's it's exponentially growing. You know, it hasn't stopped, and he's gained more confidence about everything he does. He's obviously a tremendous student. He's well liked by everyone in the building, the community, the state. Um, he's such a, besides being a hard, he's such a driven individual. That's the best way to explain it. He's driven to get better. He's never satisfied. He's very hard on himself. We actually have to kind of pull him off of himself sometimes because he's very hard on himself, very, uh, very critical of himself. And we try to make sure that we coach him harder than any other player. And why is that? Because our best players have to be able to receive our hardest coaching to be our hardest workers and our best performers. He is, uh, again, it's, you know, he's, he's young. He's young, but yet the maturity that we've seen, you know, over the past year from him and what we expect during this year has been incredible. It's exactly what you want your own son to go through in his process as he matures to be an awesome young man. We're seeing that in Justin. So the, the value of that is well beyond football well beyond football and leadership. This guy, you know, it transcends all that stuff. All right, last question right here in front of that. Just following up on that uh, Justin Herbert question, mm -hmm. you mentioned that Justin has gone from quarterback to a field general. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more about that, specifically on the football side of things? Yeah, he, can, uh, he can fix you. He can fix you when things aren't, you know, supposed to be a, aren't kind of going the way that they are. What I mean by that, if you have a particular play called into a defense where you're, you're going to suffer a negative play or there's going to be penetration due to a lack of a blocker, um, an imperfect scheme, um, a rotation of the coverage that now predicates us, you know, either call a timeout or whatnot, Justin understands both the run, the pass game, particularly the protections to get us in the right play when we have to. Part of it is teaching and alerting certain plays, and other ones are just he understands it, he gets it. And um, when a quarterback could do that, it's just, it becomes another level of football for your offense, and it, it lends to you being able to give him more and more and more and put more on his plate to be able to expand and open up the playbook. And right now the playbook, excuse me, with Justin and uh, the rest of the offense, the playbook is wide open. Thanks, Coach. Else? Guys, thank you very much. Enjoy our guys. Okay, hopefully you guys got some food and uh, appreciate you. See you soon again.